Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Joining me today is Dr. Jared Brockman, a researcher at the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University. Uh, Dr. Brockman, thanks for joining us thanks today. Thanks for having me. As we get started, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure. Well, I'm from Fargo originally. Uh, I went to college in Augustana um, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, after that, I went to graduate school and did my PhD at the University of Delaware. And uh, from there, I did a fellowship at the Central Intelligence Agency for a short time before becoming the director of research at West Point, where they had a counterterrorism center. And then I worked there for about four years and, and just returned home last year uh, back here to North Dakota State. Well, now, I had something here that said you're with the North Dakota State University Security Programs. That's you right. mentioned, uh, I mentioned you're a researcher. You mentioned tracking terrorist organizations mm -hmm. is what you do. And I asked you, as we, before we came on the air, you know, how do you get trained for this? Right. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, studying terrorist organizations is something that's very hard to do in school because things change so, so rapidly. So I've spent a lot of time on the job, I guess, trying to understand who the adversary is, watching them, listening to them, reading their, their works, and getting a better sense for you know, how, to, how to stop them from doing what they want to do. Well, there you go then. So tell us about your research. What is sure. it you're actually doing? Then? Well, most of my time is spent online. Um, and I'm, you know, one of the things a lot of people don't understand is that Al-Qaeda is, is constantly writing down what they think is important to tell their followers. It's kind of their version of Mein Kampf right, where they explain this is their, their strategy, their goals, their hopes, their fears, but also their vulnerabilities. And so I spend most of my day, you know, looking at their primary material, reading through their, their literature, trying to better understand their mindset, what they're doing, you know, on their side, and then trying to figure out where the gaps are so we can better protect ourselves and bring them down. Well, now, so how do you gain access to these sites? I mean, are, are they just there for all to see? It is. Uh, after 2001, when the U.S.-led coalition went into Afghanistan and we crushed their, their training camp structure, Al-Qaeda realized they had no other way to train and educate their followers except using the Internet. And so all of their curriculum was uploaded online. And so we saw hundreds, if not thousands, of websites popping up where people anywhere in the world could log on, access this material. And Al-Qaeda wants them to get radicalized, get trained up, and then go out and do things themselves. So it, it's all there. Some of it's password protected. Sometimes you have to use various personas to get access to it, but most of it's, it's freely available, and that's, that's one of the big problems today. Well, th then, uh, so how do these organizations go about recruiting? Uh, I, uh, mm -hmm. Mostly, I guess, I hear that young people, but I, I guess they recruit anybody, but yeah. uh, young people to, to become terrorists. Right, well, we see two directions uh, of recruiting. One is that you'll see an organization reach out and, and try to talent scout. They'll find somebody who's posting online who seems susceptible to this ideology, who seems like they're lonely or depressed or, or angry about U.S. foreign policy, and they'll reach out and, and slowly try to spin them up and say, well, hey, maybe you should get some buddies and go target shooting. Maybe you should get some buddies and watch this video. Maybe you should read this. Uh, and if, if, if they bite, then the recruiter may try to say, well, why don't you go study at this mosque in your town? Or better yet, why don't you come to Yemen? There's a great, uh, you know, cleric I'd like to introduce you to. Or better yet, why don't you come to Pakistan? You can come through the training camps. We can teach you how to shoot weapons. We can have a great time. And then when you get there, you know, why don't you swear allegiance to bin Laden? Why don't you go stand on the front lines and shoot an RPG? You know, and it happens like that. So that's one trajectory. The other one is the bottom up, where you have somebody who, who kind of self-starts. They know they're angry. They don't quite know what they want um, in life. They feel disconnected from their family. But, uh, you know, they, they need to vent somehow. And so they look and they seek out these opportunities. Maybe they'll go to Pakistan on their own and just try to get into a training camp. So uh, there, there's a lot of, you know, gray area in between that. But uh, those are the two kind of main ways that people get into this business. Well, I mean, do, you mentioned CIA. Or, uh, but does the CIA or other government uh, agencies, uh, do they track these sites as well? And, mm -hmm. and what can we do about it, if anything? Yeah, uh, I mean, most government agencies are, are tracking these sites, and, and Al-Qaeda knows that they're being tracked. Mm -hmm. So they're very careful about the kinds of language they use, about how they communicate. They use encryption technologies to, to try to mask their, their communication. So, um, you know, we are tracking, but they, they know what the laws are. And so, you know, much of what they discuss on these websites is protected under free speech laws, mm -hmm. or it's based internationally, so we can't touch it. Um, Given that, though, we have a lot of partner countries who are also tracking this and doing what they can. So, 
you know, we're doing as, as much as possible, but the fact is Al-Qaeda realizes the power of the Internet and exploits it as much as they can. Well, now, I, I, let me see if I can ask this question right. How do you define a terrorist organization versus an activist organization? Right. Well, Al-Qaeda's tried to blur the lines um, because they realize that a lot of people don't want to get involved in terrorism. Right? They're happy with their families and their big screen TVs and they like their jobs. But they also know that there's a lot of people who are frustrated and angry, bitter, and want to do something. So Al-Qaeda has been producing books. One of, the, one of the most popular books is called 39 Ways to Serve and Participate in Jihad. And it starts off by saying, look, we know you won't come to the front lines in Afghanistan or Iraq, most likely. We know you have other things going on in your life. Short of that, here's 39 things you can do from your own home to help support Al-Qaeda. There was this cleric, Anwar al-Awlaki, who's come up in the news a lot um, in connection with the Fort Hood shooting. He was the guy who was in connection with uh, the, the major who allegedly did the attack. Um, he wrote a book called 44 Ways to Serve Jihad, and it had many of those same things. Here's things you can do from the comfort of your own, own home. Much of them are not illegal, um, so, you know, but you can support al-Qaeda, support this global movement in your own way. The goal is, if you, if you start off low, you'll become invested and then they can grab you and, and bring you into the, into the fold officially. Hmm. Well, with that said then, I guess um, the would-be Christmas uh, bomber has gotten lots of attention lately, and, and in particular uh, that he was tied to Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. uh, groups in Yemen. Can, can you expand and talk about this? Sure. Some? Well, we've seen a number of, uh, of attacks. There was, um, there was the Fort Hood shooting, mm -hmm. and then we saw the Christmas Day bomber, who people have called the, the underwear bomber. Um, before that, we had seen... Uh, an assassination attempt against a Saudi prince, where a man actually who was also trained in Yemen had put explosives inside of his body um, and, and detonated that. And then we saw this Jordanian triple agent. So we've seen in the past few months a, a rash of attacks from, from Al Qaeda, lone wolf operatives, if you will. Uh, the Christmas Day bomber had been, um, had been a student from a, a, you know, an upper class family, Nigerian family. He was living in London. While he was going to school there, he posted about 300 times on a website. This is before he had joined Al Qaeda, talking about you know how lonely he was, how bitter he was, you know. But he also had a very profound sense of moral righteousness. Well, he goes off the grid for a while. Uh, he goes to Yemen, spends some time, allegedly gets gets grabbed by Al Qaeda, trained, given the explosives, and then conducts this you know almost attack. Uh, and what we found is that he is what we think one of a number of people who have been trained in Yemen, they have clean backgrounds, meaning they wouldn't raise red flags when they get on planes, they don't have criminal backgrounds, known ties to terrorists. Um, and their goal is to attack U.S. interests uh, abroad, if not the homeland. And so this is a very concerning threat. It's one the intelligence community is taking very seriously. But he and others are one of uh, a growing number of, of these low-level, low-tech operatives who are coming after us. Hmm. Do you feel like this has been politicized at all? It seems like it has. Sure. I mean, terrorism is always political because it evokes emotional responses from people. And so, uh, you know, I think, I think all politicians um, want to get this right and put national security first. But the fact is, as you try to figure out, you know, how do you best stop terrorism, there, there are disagreements about policy. And so inevitably it gets, it gets politicized. But I, I think the intelligence agencies and the, the Homeland Security folks they're consummate professionals and, and are doing the best that they can. Well, could this incident uh, have been avoided or did international red tape get in the way? That's a good question. It's something the Obama administration, um, you know, is conducting its own internal reviews about. Uh, there clearly were a number of missteps um, bureaucratically. And so the Obama administration, I know, is trying to streamline this process. But, you know, we've seen in the Fort Hood shooting, there was a number of, uh, of steps that it should have been caught. Um, and so the fact is, it's really hard, um, you know, we've got to get it right all the time. They only have to get it right just once. Uh, and that makes our job a lot harder than theirs. Well, as you and I talked, uh, because that's just, that's just it. You said uh, CIA agencies probably fold a number of plans that we don't ever hear about. But it only takes that one that right. makes all the difference in the world. I mean, having, you know, worked as an analyst inside the government and having a lot of friends who are current intelligence analysts, I know that there's a lot of frustration on their part because on a daily basis, they may be stopping plots at any level um, you know, of seriousness, and these are things we're never going to know about. But 
the one that gets through the cracks I is the one. So, you know, they may stop 10, 20, 30 attacks. We'll never know. It's the one that, that got through, and we come and criticize them. But then can you talk some about the difficulty in coordinating and targeting individuals uh, when all kinds of governments with different laws and different standards right. uh, that, that are involved with it? Yeah. I mean, the, the challenge is in an era of globalization, right, you, have, you may have a Yemeni guy who gets trained in Pakistan who's married to a Spanish wife and, you know, who then tries to conduct an attack in, in Canada. And so who, who gets first dibs on, on the guy? When, or what if he's living in a country that doesn't um, extradite, right? So there's all sorts of challenges, international legal challenges that we have to deal with, not just trying to stop him from doing what it is he's doing. But I think since 9-11, the world has come together. Uh, many countries ha have realized that this is in their interest as well um, to get this right and to work together. Well, can you talk some about al-Qaeda and, and are they reforming? Are they as strong as they used mm -hmm. to be? Yeah, al-Qaeda has changed. Um, Al-Qaeda today is very different from the Al-Qaeda of 9-11. Uh, much of that change happened, I think, between 2004 and 2005. Um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq took off. They became the, the guys everyone wanted to be like. And so Al-Qaeda's senior leadership back in Afghanistan, Bin Laden, Zawahiri, the guys we tend to see on TV, um, they fell out of touch. They were broke. They, I mean, they had no money. They had no influence. They had no attacks. They had nothing. So they started to change al-Qaeda from a terrorist organization that used propaganda to disseminate their messages into a propaganda organization that uses terrorism. And that's an important point because al-Qaeda's changed its focus. They're trying to win hearts and minds. So terrorism is just there to keep people's attention. But more than anything else, this is why they issue video after video after video. The point is to keep on message. Um, and they realize that they have more impact by getting other people to do their dirty work for them than doing it themselves. It's cheaper, it's logistically easier. So the more they talk and the more they can rile people up to go out and do attacks, the less they actually have to do, the safer they can be in their caves in Afghanistan and Pakistan. You mentioned bin Laden. Is, uh, is bin Laden uh, relevant anymore? And what kind of information do we have on him currently, yeah. if, if any significant information? Well, I get asked this question, uh, is bin Laden alive? Uh, all the time, yes, he's still alive, at least as, as far as I know, he's put out a number of tapes um, recently uh, that are authenticated to be him and, and dealing with current events. So that's one. Um, two, is he relevant? I think symbolically he's incredibly relevant still. And when we kill or capture him or if he's announced dead, I think it'll be, if we get him, it'll be a symbolic victory for us. At the same time, Al-Qaeda has transcended bin Laden. They don't need him anymore. In fact, there's arguably he has no role operationally in the movement. Um, I mean, he's under somebody's protection right now. He may know, he may not know what's going on. It doesn't really matter. They've got a bench of three guys, four guys, who are better than Bin Laden. Um, and that's, they're, they're younger. There's one guy I talk about. He's a, a young Libyan. I call him Bin Laden 2.0. I mean, he's the upgrade version. He's everything Bin Laden hoped and dreamed he would have been but wasn't. And so I think when we get Bin Laden and the old guys out of the way, Al-Qaeda is actually going to be a more dastardly enemy than we've ever seen before because we've got a young group of, of, of really bright, clever thinkers who are, are bent on destruction. Well, uh, a lot to think about yeah. when you said that. It almost means maybe we should keep, I thought we wanted to get bin Laden. Maybe we want to. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's, uh, is, is it easier for uh, terrorists to carry out attacks, say, in Europe or Indonesia or India uh, than it is getting a foothold in the United States? Well, you know, Al-Qaeda realize that, that they're very good as a coordinating body, less a, a terrorist organization. So they can tap into other terrorist groups in different places, especially places like India, where they already have an infrastructure. All they have to do is potentially fund, direct, coordinate, inspire, uh, and we see terrorist attacks there. Al-Qaeda has no infrastructure in the United States. So pulling an attack off means they have to transplant somebody from their world into our world. They have to go under the radar. They have to get through all the legal restrictions to get into this country. They have to get through the scrutiny of local and you know, law enforcement. It's very difficult to pull off a real attack here in the United States. They know that. Um, it doesn't mean they're going to stop trying, but they're going to they look for the easiest opening. And so be it on planes coming in from, from developing countries, be it in, in other places like India, they'll go for the easy target wherever possible, but they're still going to come after us. Well, with that then, is it somewhat easier for them to hit U.S. Uh, targets operating in foreign countries? Yeah, for sure. Uh, they have a history of trying to hit embassies, 
Um, but one of the things that I do at, at North Dakota State is look at Al Qaeda's, you know, they're, they're obsessed with transportation targets. We've seen them try to attack subways, commuter trains, buses, uh, airplanes on 9 11 um, and, and the Christmas Day. Uh, they realize that transportation targets are really, really key to killing a lot of people, uh, you know, in one short blow uh, and to paralyzing societies. And so at, at NDSU, this is, we're trying to set up something that focuses on how to protect our, our transit and transportation sectors from groups like Al-Qaeda, because that's their favorite target. Well, now, as you're a researcher here at North Dakota State University and, and this Midwest area, how many other researchers are out there doing similar things? Not enough. Uh, the best people we've got tend to be inside the government, and so they're not actively publishing and writing and speaking about this. So it's been a frustration of mine that we, we haven't invested a national effort like we did during the Cold War. I mean, one of the things during the Cold War, the government invested millions of dollars into universities, standing up new programs on Soviet studies and, and trying to understand the ideology driving countries like China and the Soviet Union. We haven't done the same thing uh, in this fight. I'm not quite sure why, but it's handicapped us a lot. We're really, really good at door kicking, as they say, militarily, law enforcement, there's nobody better. But when it comes to the thinking side of this, we can keep killing and capturing these guys. More guys keep coming back because there's an ideology underlying this. So at the end of the day, for Al-Qaeda, this is a fight of, uh, of wit. It's a, a fight of the mind. Um, and we haven't invested in that fight yet on our side. Okay. Well, y you were uh, interviewed recently on National Public Radio, mm -hmm. and many of us heard that, and uh, hopefully our viewers actually listen to some radio, uh, for our radio station. Uh, what was that about, and how did that go? Sure. Uh, it, it went really well. I had a chance to sit down um, in studio and, and go actually through some Al-Qaeda websites and look in, uh, at some of the propaganda that was dedicated to this Jordanian doctor who recently blew himself up in Afghanistan on a CIA base, and he killed um, four CIA officers and three others. <clears throat> and he was somebody that we had trusted um, the Jordanians. He was, he was a, a triple agent, right? He was pretending to be on our side, pretending to be on their side, but really on their side. And so he got incredible access to, to our, our folks. Um, and after his attack, uh, Al-Qaeda's websites just blew up with, um, with excitement about this guy. And so I walked, the, I walked through on NPR um, the various websites and looking at the propaganda and trying to explain not just who this guy was, but why he resonated so strongly with the global Al-Qaeda movement. Um, and I think it's, it's really problematic for us because I had been studying him for years as a, as a writer. I had no idea what his real name was. He was a, some anonymous writer who had been writing, he'd written 45 different essays about what he wanted to do to us. Then he announced he had gone to Afghanistan to join up, right? And then he fell off, fell off. And then all of a sudden we hear about the fact that he went and blew himself up. So it shows that guys who are posting online aren't just a threat to us for what they write, but now they're trying to take that step over to the, to the real world and actually blow themselves up. Uh, he's proved to be a very um, popular role model for guys on, on the internet. And I think this is a really big problem for us. Hmm. Well, then, you've talked about uh, recruiting tools a little bit earlier and the different things, but what are, what are some of the other recruiting uh, tools that terror organizations use to uh, find new members? Well, one is just having a presence out there, getting media attention, and just being known that they're active, right? Um, another, it, the Internet's very, very popular. Um, they have recruiting videos. They rely on human ambassadors, people um, who, again, aren't members of Al-Qaeda, but want to at least, you know... Um, spin other people up and get them in the mindset. Uh, they use books, they use audio tapes, they use any vehicle that they know. Now they're trying to get on Facebook and YouTube videos, social networking. Um, and so they're doing everything they can to, to exploit the technology that's out there uh, to spread their message. Well, is it correct to call uh, this a war on terror or not? Um, I know there's sometimes there's some back and forth between party officials, but what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I tend not to use the on terror uh, language. The Obama administration has moved away from that. Um, for me, this is a war against Al-Qaeda, and I think it's important. Um, this isn't just a war against an organization. For Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda is not just a group. Al-Qaeda is a global movement, and that means that it's bin Laden down to the, the kid in his parents' basement logging onto the, the websites. 
and you know it's everything in between from their mindset and so I think we need to understand that that's how they're approaching this fight and we need to approach that fight in the same way uh, you know the war language suggests that there's a military answer to this and this is much more than a military problem I mean, this is a it's a global problem it's going to require all of our agencies um, we have to get it right in Iraq and Afghanistan and that doesn't mean just you know killing a lot of guys or capturing them it means ensuring that those areas don't become safe havens again uh, which it's not easy and so I think we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us that require a lot of complex um, interactions with agencies and governments and this is not an easy fight well then what is the biggest misconception uh, out there about terrorist organizations and how they operate or how, or how they recruit well I mean one challenge that we see is, is something called mirror imaging where we <clears throat> we take what we think we look like or what we think that they should look like and then fight them in that way instead of relying on who they actually are and that means we don't take them seriously enough as adversaries so one of the things I've tried to do is let them lead the way right tell let them tell me who they are let them tell me how to beat them uh, one of the, the the guy I mentioned bin Laden 2.0 this Libyan in an interview he recently did with al-Qaeda he said if the United States was serious about defeating al-Qaeda here's a six-fold strategy for how they would do it right so you have al-Qaeda proposing a six-fold strategy on how to defeat al-Qaeda and so you have to ask well why would they do that well one it was a uh, to put his finger in our eye and say look I'm the best counterterrorism strategist that the United States has Two, it was to show his own movement that you know look at him he was you know um, parading around but three, he, he thought he was actually inoculating their movement from anything we could do by, by providing that strategy. So th I think it was a mistake. I've written about that. That's angered them. And there's been some interesting back and forth between me and, and their side based on what I write. But the fact is they write everything that they believe down on paper. And if we just read it and take it seriously, we can do a lot more damage to them than we currently are. Well, you almost kind of led into maybe what I was going to ask you, because what, what do you think we ought to be doing to counter these terrorist activities? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it's a very complicated answer. I, I think there is the, the military side of the equation, which you have to be actively going after these, um, these organizations in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. <clears throat> you have to bring their networks that are trying to recruit, finance, and move people around the world to do bad things. You have to bring those down. At the same time, you have to deal with the ideology. That means you have to be online, you have to be countering their messages, you have to take these guys on, on their terms, in their language, on their turf. You need the help of, of uh, governments around the world to do this. You need to, you need to stop the new waves of recruits that are pouring in. Um, so, you know, it, again, it takes people from the most military to, the, to you know, guys like me who are sitting behind computers, um, you know, reading about, about this so, and, and everything in between. Hmm. Well, do you believe there could be uh, another large attack on American soil in the next few years, or do you feel like there, we're better at connecting the dots and preventing these types of things? Well, there's no doubt that al-Qaeda will continue to try to, to, to attack us on our soil. Um, I don't know if they have the capability right now to pull off another 9-11, um, but I, I certainly think that they will try to, um, to repeat what we saw in London in 2005 with a coordinated um, train bombings or what happened in Madrid the year prior to that with coordinated train bombings um, truck bombings I think I think we will see a low-level attack of some kind the question is <clears throat> is it al-Qaeda you know Nadal Hassan the alleged Fort, Fort Hood shooter he wasn't al-Qaeda but if he was inspired by al-Qaeda's ideology does it really matter and, and that's one of the challenges we have to wrestle with is what is al-Qaeda tomorrow and how do we stop that are there such things as sleeper cells being put in the United States? Um, I mean, there certainly had, it, it was a priority for Al-Qaeda um, to deploy sleeper cells in other places. They've just never really had a good track record here in the U.S. Our, our security is good. Um, culturally, it's, it's just hard to operate here in the United States. So this is why they've been trying to recruit as many Americans and Canadians and people who are fluent in English um, into the movement. It's something our intelligence agencies are very uh, well aware of, and, and you know we stay uh, we stay pretty uh, you know close to the ground in our monitoring of that. Well, Dr. Farman, we appreciate the work you do, and and uh, 
But if people want more information about your research or finding out more about what we've talked about today, where, where can you point them? Yeah, they should come to the North Dakota State's uh, website, ndsu.edu, um, and they can just punch in my name um, in, in the search box, and it'll pull up all the research that we're doing over there. Okay. Well, we wish you the best with your continued research. Thanks a lot. And thank you for joining us Thanks today. for having me. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching.